to Focal Point. Welcome back to Focal Point, this Thursday edition of Focal Point on AFR Talk. You are listening to Focal Point on the American Family Radio uh, Talk Network. Focal Point, the home of muscular Christianity on conservative talk radio. Uh, Our guest on our decision maker line is Andy McCarthy. Andy is a senior fellow at National Review Institute and a contributing editor at National Review. I read everything he writes, compelling and insightful on the subject of Islam and the threat that it represents today. Uh, Andy, welcome back to Focal Point with Brian Fisher. Hey, Brian, thanks very much for having me. Well, it's great to have you. And, Andy, I want to get right to, right to it. First of all, uh, uh, tell us just a, a bit, because some of our listeners may not be familiar with the best-selling book that you wrote several years ago called The Grand Jihad, How Islam and the Left Sabotage America. And I just wanted you to take 60 seconds or so to tell us what we know about the agenda of the Muslim Brotherhood in North America. And we know it from what they themselves have said. Well, that's exactly right, Brian. The, my title of the book, uh, The Grand Jihad, actually comes from an internal Muslim Brotherhood memorandum that was uncovered during a uh, criminal prosecution, probably the most important in the area of terrorism finance that the Justice Department has ever done, called the Holy Land Foundation case. Uh, That was uh, really a Muslim Brotherhood conspiracy. The Holy Land Foundation was kind of a piggy bank in America that they uh, put together to support Hamas uh, throughout the Intifada and, you know, other uh, times that Hamas was doing its uh, usual dirty business. Supporting Hamas has been uh, one of the top priorities of the Muslim Brotherhood uh, since Hamas came into existence in the late 1980s. But the other... Um, a vowed purpose they have is to destroy the West. And in the internal memorandum I'm talking about, the group's leaders in America are informing the group's leadership globally in Egypt about how uh, Muslim Brotherhood operatives in the West uh, and in America see their task. And he says, so they say, uh, that they are on a grand jihad aimed at eliminating and destroying Western civilization from within by sabotage. So... That is their own words, and that is exactly the way that they um, describe their mission. And when you look at the things they do and the way they uh, the way they speak about and act toward the West, uh, you can see they're not kidding. Now, let me ask Andy. Uh, we talk about the Muslim Brotherhood, and people read about them. They maybe associate them with Egypt. They don't realize that a lot of organizations that are very active in the United States are arms of the Muslim Brotherhood. So, tell us a little bit about those. And then what's your assessment about the tentacles of the Muslim Brotherhood? Have they gotten inside the White House? Well, the Muslim Brotherhood is a global organization. It, it, it uh, arose in Egypt uh, in the 1920s, really as a reaction to the uh, secularization project of, uh, of Ataturk, who was, uh, who was trying to purge Sharia, which is Islam's societal structure, from the public square. Um, and ever since the Brotherhood was established, it has become a global organization, and the United States and the West are no, uh, no different from uh, any place else in terms of its uh, ambitions to, uh, to reach out and spread its wings. So uh, in the United States, they have been here for about half a century. The um, building block of the organization, not surprisingly given that its founder Hassan al-Banna was, an, uh, was a teacher. Uh, the, the, found, the foundational building block here is an outfit called the Muslim Students Association, uh, where you know, they grab young people who are uh, you know, in, influential uh, or can be influenced, rather, uh, and you know, are, are potential uh, Brotherhood members. Uh, and they begin to indoctrinate them in Brotherhood uh, ideology, including the the writings of uh, of Bana and uh, Saeed Qutb, who is the uh, who is another um, of the most important of the Brotherhood theoreticians, and who himself has been a uh, a very important uh, intellectual foundation for uh, terrorist movements. So, so, Andy, you look at something like the Muslim Student Association. It sounds harmless. It sounds innocent. Just some college students getting together for a little fellowship around their shared faith. But what I hear you saying is this, this, this really could be a place where a lot of young American males, maybe even American, uh, uh, American natives, even Caucasian Americans, could be radicalized into the tenets of Islam. 
Well, just to just to take a few, Brian, the, you know, Anwar al laki uh, the uh, famous uh, now deceased Al Qaeda uh, operative who was uh, was killed by a uh, drone missile in Yemen, and has uh, uh, you know that that killing actually has spawned a whole other debate that we've been having in the United States. But he got his start uh, at the uh, running the Muslim Brotherhood. Uh, or, I'm sorry, the Muslim Students Association in Colorado. Another guy named Wild Jalidin is one of the founders of Al-Qaeda. He uh, ran the Muslim Student Association in Arizona. So, you know, you, if, if you go through uh, these chapters, some of them are seemingly harmless, uh, but there are a lot of people who have uh, grown to be real Muslim Brotherhood firebrands or even terrorists. Uh, who got their start in the Muslim Brotherhood. Now, let me uh, ask you, sorry, in the Muslim Student Association. Let me ask you for a moment about John Brennan. We've got a former FBI agent out there saying that he actually converted to Islam when he was in Saudi Arabia working in the CIA. Uh, there's a scene in Zero Dark Thirty. I haven't seen it, but a scene apparently where there's a CIA individual in the movie. Again, it's a movie, but some people think, and, and when somebody walks into his office, he's on his uh, Islamic prayer rug, and some people think that that's based on uh, John Brennan. Do you give any credibility uh, to the fact that he may be a Muslim convert, and whether he is or not, he obviously seems to be a Muslim sympathizer. He's head of the CIA. How worried should we be about that? Well, I think we should be very worried about the fact that, um, that he is an apologist for Islamists in a very high and influential position in government, and whether he comes about it from some uh, you know, personal conviction that, that's so deep uh, that... that you know, it has led him to, to join that movement, uh, or whether he just uh, feels as an intellectual matter, as, any, as many progressives in the United States do, um, that, you know, Islamists are part of the solution rather than part of the problem we face. Uh, you know, I don't, I don't really know, uh, but I do know that his effort to uh, kind of whitewash both Islamist ideology and some terrorist organizations like uh, Hezbollah, which he has referred to as an evolving kind of moderate, or at least a, an organization that has moderate wings to it. Um, and, and his whole idea of presenting jihad to um, uh, the American people as if it were uh, nothing more sinister than, you know, the, uh, the internal struggle to remember to brush your teeth after every meal, when, you know, in fact, we know that uh, uh, the history of jihad has its roots in forcible military activity i think it's a it's a real a mistake to have him be your barometer for understanding the islamic world and i particularly think it's pernicious to have somebody whose main mission seems to be to throw blinders on the intelligence community which is the one aspect of government we really need to have see this threat clearly brennan's been behind this idea of purging the training materials of the uh, that we use to train law enforcement, intelligence, and military operatives uh, so that they can get a better understanding of the threats we face. He's purged those materials of information that, uh, you know, Muslim Brotherhood-type groups uh, think is um, uh, not accurate or think is unflattering of Islam. Well, some of that information is what we used to call evidence when I was a prosecutor in the 90s. Now, you have... <clears throat> Speaking of prosecution, you put uh, the blind shake behind bars responsible for the 1993 World Trade Center bombing, so you know about prosecuting uh, Islamic terrorists in, in federal court. But I think you correctly have criticized the Obama administration for doing something, I think, very sneaky, and you called them out on this. They kind of did it when nobody was looking. What they have done with Osama bin Laden's son-in-law, who was captured, I believe, in Turkey and is now in U.S. custody, and tell us what they did with him that represents uh, a, 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 a foolish and misguided move. Well, this is a guy by the name of Suleiman Abu Ghait. Um, he is, as you point out, uh, Osama bin Laden's son-in-law. Um, he was also a high enough ranking figure in al-Qaeda that he was known in, uh, in those, uh, the network of terrorism circles as the consigliere of the, of the group. Um, the Obama administration is, of course, under a congressional restriction that uh, what Congress has basically said is that it doesn't want uh, government funds to be used to move enemy combat combatants who are at uh, Guantanamo Bay and detained there 
uh, into the United States for civilian trials in the United States. Um, that has prevented uh, those guys from, from uh, getting here. It's prevented things like having a uh, civilian trial of Khalid Sheikh Mohammed in Manhattan, which they tried, the Obama administration tried to do uh, early on. And it has underscored that Congress wants enemy combatants handled by the military commission system that Congress designed. What the Obama administration has done here is uh, working in coordination with Turkey and our, uh, our counterterrorism allies in Jordan. They, basically, the Turks moved this guy, Abu Ghaith, to Jordan, where we have very good cooperation. Uh, we were able to grab him there, and the Obama administration, instead of designating him as an enemy combatant so we could interrogate him over a long period of time and get intelligence, they whisked him into Manhattan. Uh, he's not under the congressional... Uh, prescription because he's not and never was at Guantanamo Bay. I think he should have been, but he, he never was. Uh, so they have brought him into Manhattan and announced that he is going to be prosecuted in a civilian trial for the 9-11 attacks, among other things. So uh, by doing this, they not only don't designate him as an enemy combatant and see what intelligence there is that we might be able to get from him, which is extremely uh, important in this war, um, we also have the twofer in the sense that they um, have undermined the military commissions because now the guys who are looking like Khalid Sheikh Mohammed at a, at a military commission for the 9-11 attacks can complain to the courts, and I think the courts will be receptive to this, that they're getting inferior due process when a guy like Abu Ghaz has been brought into civilian court and is getting grade A due process for, uh, for the same, essentially the same offense. One last question, Andy. I only got 30 seconds for this, and I don't know if you can answer it in 30 seconds. We've had two more U.S. soldiers shot in Afghanistan by a policeman, by somebody in, wearing a uniform. I've never believed that nation-building in an Islamic land is possible. Do you believe that we can do nation-building in a Muslim country, yes or no? Uh, I, I, I don't think we can do it the way we're doing it with the, uh, with the military. I think we should always uh, promote our values, but I don't think the... Uh people in the Islamic world want Western civilization, so that's a big hurdle to overcome. Our guest has been Andy McCarthy, Senior Fellow at National Review Institute, a contributing editor at National Review, author of the best-selling book, I highly recommend, The Grand Jihad, How Islam and the Left Sabotage America. Andy, thank you for taking time to be with us. Appreciate your work. Thank you, Brian. Take care. Andy McCarthy, National Review Institute. Focal Point, AFR Talk, back with your calls and more in two. Stay with us.